Being told that you're gonna spend the rest of your life in prison is a lot to take in, regardless of the crime you've committed. But just when you think you know how people will react to such a sentence, they go and surprise you. These are the craziest reactions of convicts after being given a life sentence. Number 20. Diana Lovejoy Divorce can be hard on any couple, whether it's amicable or completely one-sided. Sometimes money has to change hands, and children are often involved. Sure, it's hard, but is it worth trying to end your significant other's life? Diana Lovejoy may no longer have thought so when she was officially convicted of being involved in a botched murder-for-hire plot targeting her husband. This is how this convict reacted after hearing the sentence. When the verdict was read out, people in the courtroom gasped as Diana passed out and fell. Find the defendant, Weldon K. McDavid, guilty of the crime of conspiracy to commit murder. The judge, Sim von Kalinowski, ordered the courtroom to be cleared so she could receive medical attention. Diana was subsequently wheeled out of the courtroom on a gurney, and a paramedic told newspapers that she appeared to have been overcome by shock. I guess you can't really blame her for that. The guilty verdict would see her faced with a prison sentence of 25 years to life, while her firearms instructor, Weldon McDavid Jr., who pulled the trigger, faced a penalty of up to 50 years to life. So what led Diana to make this drastic decision to hire somebody to try to kill her husband? A jury forewoman said that Diana didn't want to share custody of their young son or give him $120,000 that formed part of their divorce agreement. Like this video, smash the subscribe button and click the notification bell right now or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Now it's time for the odd topic. Just wait until you hear how this convict reacted after hearing their sentence. It's maybe one of the most relatable reactions we've ever seen. We would certainly react the same. In this moment, you can see that while the man is a criminal, he's still very much a human. Making no attempt to appear cool, calm, or collected, he cried and heaved with emotion. He loudly and passionately wails. It's hard not to feel for him, which is crazy considering that this man, Blake Jefferson, murdered his own mother. Or so they say. He is accused of attacking his mother and stabbing her to death after overdosing on prescription meds. The man had been having extreme mental health issues for some time, describing bizarre visions. Many feel he's someone who should have been sanctioned and looked after, not imprisoned in a jail. As always, comment down below with the hashtag oddtopic and let us know your opinion in relation to what we just showed on screen. With that said, let's keep things moving. Number 19. Ellis Ortiz Nieves Kent County man Ellis Nelson Ortiz Nieves described Kent County Circuit Court Judge Mark Trusak as a monster and evil. He said what Ellis did was disgusting and sickening, and when you learn what he did, you might very well agree. Ellis was sentenced to mandatory life in prison without the possibility of parole for beating a four-year-old child to death. Deputies were called to a home where Ellis was left to care for many children under the age of 11, including the deceased four-year-old boy, Giovanni Mejias. The deputies found Giovanni actively dying on the kitchen floor, and a later autopsy after his death revealed an abdominal tear that caused internal bleeding. He also had injuries on his head, buttocks, ribs, and lower back. Ellis went through the court process to have his convictions overturned, which involved hearing about what he did to Giovanni. He reacted badly when the judge started describing Giovanni's injuries before his death and said, I'm not gonna sit here and let you say crazy <laughs> shit about me, man. I ain't gonna let you say I ain't gonna let you here say no crazy shit about me, man. He struggled with deputies and had to be removed from the courtroom before returning around 10 minutes later. I suppose that's a pretty normal reaction for not only life in prison for felony murder, but an extra 80 to 150 years for first degree child abuse. Number 18 Antonio Barbo. Antonio was just 14 years old when he was sentenced to spend at least 36 years in prison for the murder of his 78-year-old great-grandmother with a hatchet. Along with a friend, Nathan Pape, he visited Barbara Olson's home to steal money, and they then took turns to beat her with a hatchet and hammer. Yeah, the crime was as horrific as it sounds, but when Antonio was handed the 36-year sentence and tried to read his apologetic statement, he broke down in tears. Um, an attack, uh, 
He wasn't able to read the statement through his tears and passed it to his defense attorney to read. He too struggled to fight back the tears while reading it. According to news stories in around 2013, after the crime took place, Antonio's great-grandmother invited both boys into her home. When her back was turned so that she could call Antonio's mother on the phone, he hit her in the head with a hatchet. Feeling sick, he ran to the bathroom, and Nathan hit her multiple times with a hammer. According to Judge Timothy Von Ackerin, the 36-year sentence was the minimum for the crime, which he said was nothing short of horrific. He also said in his 24 years on the bench, he had never seen anything remotely close to this nature of crime. Antonio will be around age 50 before he's eligible for release. Number 17. Glendria Morris and La Shirley Morris When a child sneaks a cupcake from the kitchen, you might tell them off for spoiling their dinner or simply tell them they're cheeky and not to do it again. In 2017, three-year-old Kiwan Mason did this one innocent thing, and he paid with his life. After taking the cupcake, La Shirley Morris, the sister of his appointed guardian, Glendria Morris, beat him with a baseball bat. Glendria then allegedly spanked him. The attack left bruises all over his body, and Kiwan died. The Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office said he died of blunt force trauma with bruises on his legs, back, chest, buttocks, arm, and head. La Shirley Morris will now spend the rest of her life in prison after pleading guilty to murder, two felony murder counts, aggravated assault, cruelty to children in the first degree, and cruelty to children in the third degree. These charges would have been challenging to come to terms with, but it was actually the grandmother who had the most powerful reaction to this awful tragedy. Kiwan's grandmother was present at the bond hearing, where she objected to the bond being lowered from $200,000. She struggled through tears when she said, I have five grandbabies. I had six. It is unfair. He was three years old. What can a baby do, three years old, to make you beat him to death? Number 16. Ryan Stone when some criminals look back on all the pain and suffering they caused in the immediate aftermath of an incident, they can sometimes feel remorse. They might say things just got quickly out of control, and that they feel bad for any injuries and pain that they may have caused. But when Ryan Stone was caught after a 90-minute high-speed chase in 2014 that resulted in 18 charges and one man's life being completely changed, his reaction was quite surprising. He decided to mock the victims of his crimes. While Ryan's family said he was actually a compassionate person and just struggled with drug addiction and was troubled, authorities were able to show Ryan in another light. After stealing an SUV carrying a four-year-old boy from a gas station and traveling at excessive speeds, he bragged about making international news and belittled his victims. Ryan also hit Trooper Bellum and he at 90 miles an hour, shattering his leg while he was trying to deploy spikes to slow Ryan down. To that, Ryan said that the trooper shouldn't have been standing in the middle of the highway. As troubled as Ryan might be, that reaction was surprising to most people. For attempted manslaughter, first-degree assault, and child abuse, among over a dozen other charges, Ryan was sentenced to 160 years in prison. He would be eligible for parole after 75 years at age 105. Number 15. James Herard. When James Herard was sentenced to die for ordering the death of restaurant worker Eric Jean-Pierre in 2008, all he could do was smirk, make faces, lean back in his chair, and shake his head. Meanwhile, his mother would sit in a corner seat leaning on the wall for support and remain silent while tears welled up in her eyes. As shocking as it would be for most people to hear that they're being sentenced to death, it didn't mean anything to James. Pretty much, you know what I mean? I pretty, I pretty much, I'm pretty much daring you to give me the death sentence, pretty much. Who was already serving multiple life sentences for four incidents that he was involved in as the leader of a gang called Backstreet Crips. James played a part in several robberies at Dunkin' Donuts stores, one of which resulted in the death of a customer who he shot in the back to warn other customers. He also became involved in a confrontation with a rival gang, the Bloods, which ended with him shooting a rival gang member. Fortunately, he survived, and James was convicted of attempted murder. Just a month later, Eric Jean-Pierre was walking home from a bus stop when he was selected at random as James's next victim. James and other gang members were involved in a body count contest, and James ordered fellow gang member Tharad Bell to shoot Eric. James said Tharad would not have done it if he didn't provoke him, so he said he took full credit and blame for the shooting. 
Number 14. Jaleel Smith Riley. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I made a mistake, Jaleel Smith Riley said, crying as a motion to withdraw his guilty plea for killing a woman and injuring her boyfriend was denied. He then collapsed as he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. In 2013, Jaleel visited a property in Norwood in an attempt to rob it. He shot Portia Brooks, killing her, and injured her boyfriend, Aaron Martin. Aaron survived a gunshot to the head, which resulted in long-lasting issues. According to some reports, they were shot because they had no money to steal. The case would sit open for many months until a tip to Crime Stoppers saw Jaleel arrested for the crimes two years later. In 2013, Jaleel pleaded guilty to aggravated murder and attempted murder. However, he then wrote a letter to the judge trying to withdraw his guilty plea. It's not known what was in the letter, but his request was denied. Before the judge handed down the sentence, Portia's mother spoke about how he killed her daughter and killed her as well. She said, I am a prisoner of my grief. When he was sentenced, Jaleel was given an opportunity to apologize, which is when he said he was sorry. <laughs> His defense attorney, Scott Rubenstein, said Jaleel was someone that felt genuine remorse. He also said that Jaleel thinks about this every day and knows he can't go back in time and undo what he did. Number 13. TJ Lane in 2013, T.J. Lane was sentenced to three life terms in prison for killing three classmates at Chardon High School in Ohio in 2012. He was waiting for a bus to an alternative school when he killed the three students and injured three others. Two 16-year-olds and a 17-year-old lost their lives, and those who lived suffered severe injuries such as paralysis. You might think that TJ Lane simply snapped, but there has to be a reason why the prosecutor said he's a disgusting human being. He arrived at his sentence hearing wearing the standard blue button-down shirt, but when he sat down and unbuttoned it, he revealed a white t-shirt underneath that had the word KILLER written on it in black marker. Then, when he was given the opportunity to make a statement to the court, his reaction was absolutely shocking. Yes, Your Honor. And is your desire to do this? Yes. He gave a short, crude statement with vile words spewed towards the victim's families, then ended with, Beep, all of you. He then stuck his middle finger up in the courtroom. When family members of the victims called him an animal and repulsive, he smirked and smiled. He even laughed when one of the victim's mothers spoke, even though her words were heartbreaking. Just, wow, that's all I can say. Number 12. Jaleel Hoskins when a mother of five, Latrice Mays, went missing, authorities had a reason to believe her body was incinerated and dumped in a landfill after Jaleel Hoskins put her in a dumpster. They charged him with murder, but he pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of second-degree murder on the third day of his trial. What was quite absurd about his reaction was that he didn't have one. As the judge was outlining that he was remanded to custody in the Department of Corrections, he just stood still. But then, out of nowhere, as authorities were attempting to lead him away, he reacted in a burst of rage by tipping over the podium he had been standing at in front of the judge. An officer had to restrain him, and two more had to assist in moving him out of the courtroom through a side door. While this is happening, his mother's screaming out to him, telling him that she loves him before she gets into an altercation with the victim's mother. <coughs> For several minutes, there's chaos in the building before security is able to take charge of the situation and everyone calms down. Number 11. Fernando Salgado. Fernando Salgado, an 18-year-old student from California, was arraigned on sexual assault charges in the Fontana Superior Court. He pleaded not guilty to two charges related to incidents in a classroom at A.B. Miller High School and did so calmly. But his calm demeanor soon turned into utter devastation when he was ordered to remain in jail until July 9th. His bail was set at $300,000. When Fernando learned this, he absolutely exploded. He screamed and cried, Get me out of here! Get me out of here! I, I want to go home so bad! He was then led away from his family back to jail, screaming and crying. 
Fernando also wasn't the only one charged with such crimes. His teacher, 27-year-old Emmanuel De La Rosa, also appeared in court in connection with the alleged sexual assault of two students, and three other male students were arrested and charged. The victims of these alleged sexual assaults were a 14-year-old boy and another boy of an unknown age. The details of the crimes were not made public at the time, but both Fernando and his teacher, Emmanuel, were charged with two felony counts of false imprisonment and attempted sexual penetration with a foreign object. Number 10. Jacob Matt Morgan the case around 17-year-old Jacob Mad Morgan from Rock Hill is complicated. And even after he was sentenced to 15 years after pleading guilty to involuntary manslaughter and unlawful conduct toward a child, he's the only one that really knows the truth about what happened to his 14-month-old brother, Joshua Hill. Prosecutors in the case said that Jacob stood outside a trailer and watched as fire engulfed it with his baby brother inside. He denied being a monster and pleaded guilty under the Alford plea, which means to accept punishment but not admitting guilt to lighting the fire. Jacob says he wished he could have gotten to Joshua in time, but there's no proof that he used the phone in his pocket to call 911. Instead, it was a neighbor that called, and firefighters and a police officer were the ones who tried to save the baby. Evidence also showed that the fire had been set in multiple spots, which also pointed to it being intentional. Even after he was sentenced, Jacob denied what happened and was crying as he was led away to a holding cell. <laughs> His mother and stepdad struggled to believe that what Jacob did was anything other than an accident. Number 9. Dexter Johnson Dexter Johnson was accused of some pretty bad stuff. He was sentenced to death after being involved in the deaths of Maria Aparesi and we know in Harris County. When he was 18, Dexter and four other teenagers carjacked and robbed Maria and Hui before taking them to a secluded location. Once there, he raped Maria and he and another teen shot them both. These two deaths were part of a 25-day crime spree in which five other people were murdered during robberies. During the trial leading up to his eventual sentencing, Dexter had been pretty stone-faced. When he was sentenced, he looked up, pressed his lips together, and his eyes filled with tears. Dexter then looked at his family, lifted his hand almost like he was waving, then threw a chair. Officers were quick to restore justice by tackling him, and a male relative could be heard saying, don't kill him. Two other family members collapsed, and others were sobbing. District Judge Denise Collins took a moment to ask the parents of Maria if they were okay before hugging Maria's mother and shaking her father's hand. Dexter was meant to be executed in 2019, but a federal judge canceled it to give his new attorney time to investigate his case. Number 8. Ricky Hand when criminals receive a sentence in the courtroom, it's not uncommon for them to throw their hands up in the air. They might even throw over a chair, a podium, or slam their fists on a table. But to throw feces? Now that's something entirely different. In 2016, 46-year-old Ricky Hand appeared in a Springfield, Ohio courtroom to be sentenced for multiple armed robberies. He had committed about 30 robberies and was on parole before he committed another crime. He was definitely not happy to learn that he would be serving 40 years in prison. He asked the judge, did you just give me 40 years, sir? Did you just give me 40 years, sir? You just gave me 40 years. Well, guess what? Then Ricky reached for something under his arm and, well, that's how feces and urine ended up in an Ohio courtroom. Apparently, Ricky had hidden pill bottles filled with feces and urine inside the arm sling he was wearing. It was almost like he knew this court case wasn't going to go in his favor and he wanted to go out with a bang. Within just a few seconds, courtroom officials restrained Ricky. Afterward, the sheriff's office investigated how it could have happened since searches were required before entering the courtroom. This was clearly not done in this case. Number 7. David Moses 
when David Moses was 17 years old in 2010, he entered the home of an 81-year-old woman, Dorothy Session, with two other teens to burglarize it. Surprised to find the woman home, David hit her. One surprise hit turned into a brutal attack, with the woman suffering a broken nose, missing teeth, black eyes, and cuts to her mouth. Dorothy died from her injuries, and David, along with 15-year-old and 17-year-old sisters, were convicted of murder. As David was a juvenile when he was sentenced to 25 years to life in 2012, he was resentenced in 2020 to abide by extra requirements due to the fact that he was tried as an adult for murder as a juvenile. Even after all that time in prison, it didn't seem like anything had changed, and he was given the same sentence again. The court found that the crime's circumstances and his behavior in prison didn't warrant a change in his sentence length. And if you saw how he reacted in court, you might gain insight into why they possibly came to that conclusion. Throughout the resentencing, David looked bored and amused. News stations described him as acting strangely, and he even appeared to fall asleep twice. Number 6. Anthony Rodriguez Anthony Rodriguez had just turned 18 and was out on probation for potentially violence-related crimes when he robbed, kidnapped, and sexually assaulted a deaf woman in Martin Luther King Jr. Park in Bakersfield in March 2012. DNA evidence linked him to the crime a few months later, and he was found guilty that August. According to the Statement of Facts, the woman was walking to her house through the park when a man approached her, threw her to the ground, mounted her, and took her backpack. She tried to retrieve the bag, which contained her mother's laptop, but the man grabbed her shirt and dragged her towards a restroom. He then ripped her shirt, punched her in the head, and sexually assaulted her while she repeatedly signed the word no. He left a few minutes later with the backpack. During the trial, Anthony was silent. However, his outburst on the final day, when he was sentenced to 30 years to life, shocked everyone. News networks described it as an explosive conclusion. He started yelling profanities and screaming that it wasn't fair. Authorities pushed him down, and he was eventually taken out of the courtroom. After the trial, his family said the sentence was extreme. His mother, crying, said that something must be wrong because he didn't deserve 30 years. Number 5. Derek Thomas and Shondell Jackson Shondell was suspected of firing the weapon, and Derek said Shondell did so because the victim, Nathan Potter, didn't have any money. Derek acted as the lookout as Shondell approached Nathan with the 45 caliber handgun. After the shooting, they ran to Derek's house to play video games. Shondell was convicted of first-degree intentional homicide and robbery, and how he acted in the courtroom gave many people insight into how Shondell was able to do what he did. He showed no sorrow or remorse, and even smiled when he was escorted from the courtroom at one point. But his smiles soon turned to absolute rage when he was handed a sentence of life in prison with no chance of parole. He grew violent, cursed at the judge, and police had to move in quickly. But it's almost like they predicted he would act this way because they used pepper spray and restrained him swiftly. Members of Shondell's family didn't appear to be much better, to be honest. Some of them yelled at Nathan's mother, saying, I hate you, I hate you all, along with God's the judge. I think the judge is the judge. Number 4. Michael Marin. I'm not gonna lie, this would have to be one of the most dramatic and downright devastating reactions to a court case. Michael Marin, a former Wall Street trader, was found guilty of burning his $3.5 million house down in the Phoenix area in 2009. Oddly, he emerged from the burning mansion in scuba gear. As it turns out, he torched the house because he couldn't keep up with the payments. He had previously tried to sell the house with a lottery, but it was deemed illegal and shut down. Juror number five, is this your true verdict? Yes. Juror number nine, is this your true verdict? Anyway, when he was found guilty of arson and insurance fraud in June 2012, and he was facing a prison sentence of 7 to 21 years, he put his head in his hands and put something in his mouth before drinking from a sports bottle. And then, after some convulsions, he was dead. Michael collapsed in court and couldn't be revived. According to the Maricopa County Medical Examiner's Office, Michael had poison in his system, and it appears he took cyanide before his death. He had purchased a cyanide canister in 2011 from a California mail-order chemical supplier. Number 3. 
Luis Bracamontes. Luis Bracamontes shot and killed Michael David Davis Jr., a Placer County Sheriff's homicide detective, and Danny Oliver, a Sacramento County Sheriff's deputy. As you'd expect, he was charged for these crimes, as was his wife, Janelle Marquez Monroy. As he sat in court, Luis seemed to lose interest in the hours of testimony about his crime spree in 2014. Regarding the charge in count two, that honor about October 24th. He was smiling as the opening statements were read in the courtroom, and he eventually went off at the court on the same day. Luis said, Feek it, I don't want to be here no more. Feek the jury too, and the dead cops, and their stupid fucking families too. But he wasn't done. Ladies and gentlemen, Luis went on to say, Feek you, judge, as he was led from the courtroom. That was the final straw. His outbursts were becoming quite distracting, as he was known to burst out in fits of laughter and interrupt with profanities and threats as well. Eventually, the judge ruled that Luis had to remain out of the court during the entire guilt phase of the trial. However, the judge agreed to entertain defense motions to bring him back in if there's enough evidence to do so. Number 2. Van Brett Watkins Ray Carruth, a former Carolina Panther, spent 18 years in prison for conspiring the murder of Cherica Adams, his pregnant girlfriend at the time. Thanks to an emergency cesarean delivery, his son, Chancellor Lee Adams, survived. However, he was born with cerebral palsy. While Ray spent 18 years in prison for this horrific event, he wasn't the only person involved. Drug dealer Michael Kennedy claimed Ray had paid him to buy the gun used to kill Cherica, and the admitted trigger man was Van Brett Watkins. Van Brett Watkins is also in prison, and he'll be there until he's at least 85 years old in 2046. Hide from all that. I left New York City. According to Channel 9, Van still has a lot of anger towards Ray Carruth. He said he detests liars and that they were destined for hellfires. Van Brett Watkins said this in letters he had been writing to reporter Glenn Counts, who covered the trial. At that time, Van was 44 years old and had at least another 20 to 30 years before he would have an opportunity to face Ray as a free man. There was definitely a lot to untangle in this case. Number 1. Trey Relford You see things get quite heated in courtrooms. Families of defendants yell at families of victims, and it always seems like there are two very distinct sides in courtrooms. But surprisingly, that wasn't the case when Trey Relford was sentenced to 31 years in prison in 2017 for the 2015 murder of Salahuddin Jidmood. Salahuddin was stabbed to death and robbed while delivering pizza in Lexington, Kentucky. Three people were initially arrested, including Trey, but a grand jury indicted only Trey. When he was sentenced, Salahuddin's father, Dr. Abdul Munim Sambat Jitmud, embraced him and brought the judge to tears by forgiving Trey for what he did. Dr. Jitmud said that his son was a gentle, generous, and shy man with an interest in rapping, writing, and producing. He went on to say that his son had just one more delivery for the night before he was murdered, making his death even more tragic. However, he didn't blame Trey for what he did, but rather he was angry at the devil who misguided him to do such a crime. When Dr. Jitmood hugged Trey, Trey hugged him back. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It was definitely an emotional scene. It's incredible to see just how many criminals act in different ways when they learn about their fate. Some appear shocked that they have to pay for their crimes, while others are remorseful or downright nasty to the victims' families. Did any of these cases happen near you? Or are you aware of any other shocking ones like these? Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time!